Hi, this is Emily Freitag with Instruction Partners, and I'm deeply excited to be talking today to Dr. Gloria Ladson-Billings in our Rethinking Intervention series. Um, to launch, as we do with all these conversations, Dr. Ladson-Billings, first of all, thank you so much for taking the time and for your leadership during this time. Um, and please tell us a story from your own journey as a learner and what that informs in your perspective about learning. So, um, first of all, thank you for inviting me. It's my pleasure to be here. Um, I grew up in Philadelphia, which at the time was a very large city, mm -hmm. uh, much larger than it is today. It was the fourth largest city in the nation. So think of where Houston is now, and that's, that was Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. um, very vibrant city, full of history, you know, part of the entire founding of the nation. Um, but it was what legal folks would call a de facto segregated city mm -hmm. um, because of the segregation of its neighborhoods. And now I've more recently started saying that it's all de jure. There's no such thing as de facto. Mm -hmm. It's just where up the stream do you put the segregation? So in the North, the segregation was put in housing, mm -hmm. but it was deliberate and it was legal to do mm -hmm. that. Um, but as a result of that, I attended a, uh, Ex almost exclusively black neighborhood school. Now there were some white students in my neighborhood. I think that's another thing that people miss. Um, it's as if we never saw white people. We did. Mm -hmm. Most of them chose to go to Catholic schools. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I had one young boy in my neighborhood, lived across the street from me, who went to a, a boarding school that was for quote orphans. Now he was considered an orphan because his father was deceased. Mm -hmm. He lived with his mother, hmm. but not having was that a father. the Hershey school? Was Excuse that the Hershey school? No, Hershey's way out there. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. This is the Ger Gerard College. Mm -hmm. uh, it's in the city of Philadelphia. So from Monday through Friday, he was mm -hmm. gone. He came home on the weekends. So mm -hmm. we saw white students, but they didn't go to school with us. In my elementary school, there was one white family and they were extremely poor, probably the poorest mm -hmm. people in the school. Um, but I will tell you, uh, going to that school and having mostly African-American teachers, not exclusively, mm -hmm. but mostly, um, I kept hearing over and over that I was capable of doing things mm -hmm. and that you shouldn't be afraid to try this. And why wouldn't you think you're smart enough? And so this constant, almost drumbeat of you, you can do this. Another thing that happened to me is in second grade, uh, I got skipped to the third grade. Mm -hmm. The second semester of second grade, I went to the third grade. Now, what was interesting about that experience was I didn't, I don't think I went because I was smart. I went because we were baby boomers and there's too many of us. <laughs> and so here was this class that was filled to, capacity getting some more students and the principal mm. asked the teacher to designate two people who could go to the next level and it was me and one other girl mm. who all these years I still remember her name was Barbara Jean Hampton mm. so, but we both went to third grade and I can remember being in third grade the smallest child in the class and I didn't know how to tell time they mm. did and that was my first experience where I wasn't sort of the head of the class, of, but it was, mm -hmm. it, it was empowering for me to finally learn how to tell time um, because I felt like I belonged with my peers. Mm -hmm. uh, I went to both integrated junior highs, which we call them then, not middle schools, mm -hmm. uh, seven, eight, seven, eighth and ninth grade and high schools. Mm -hmm. uh, my, high, my junior high school experience was just horrible. And I don't know whether it was horrible because it was junior high, mm -hmm. having taught middle school, and it's mm -hmm. just horrible anyway. Mm -hmm. Or was it that school? But I did encounter some issues of racism from adults mm -hmm. in that setting. Um, but high school, which was also integrated, but more equally integrated. And I'm saying integrated as opposed to desegregated. There was no court order. It's just that where mm -hmm. my high school sat, it was on the cusp of a black and a Jewish neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So it was almost 50% black and Jewish. 
Uh, the, the few white students who were there who were not Jewish, we used to always tease them. We would say, what Catholic school did you get kicked out of? <laughs> because if they were Irish or Italian, they probably started out in Catholic school. The parochial system in um, Philadelphia is extensive, mm -hmm. uh, very large. Um, so, but my high school was very academically rigorous, uh, but at the same time, very socially, uh, very comfortable for me. It was tracked. So mm -hmm. in academic courses, I had hardly any black classmates. Mm -hmm. I can remember being in school sometime on a Jewish holiday before Jewish holidays were considered uh, school Probably holidays. And it would just be me and the teacher mm -hmm. um, because everybody was, was a high holy day and everybody was gone. So I had those experiences um, and I chose to go to a historically black college. Mm -hmm. Now, some people find that really odd, particularly white colleagues, because I got accepted at really good, quote, uh, white schools, including uh, Ivy League. I was accepted at the University of Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. Temple, Swarthmore, Bryn Mawr, because mm -hmm. um, uh, I applied to everything that was nearby, nearby. to appease mm -hmm. my mother. Mm -hmm. um, but I chose a school in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, it just seemed like a fit for me. I had visited it. It was a city school. Mm -hmm. uh, there were a lot of working class kids. I just felt like I, I'll fit here. Um, my parents didn't go to college. My father didn't finish mm -hmm. third grade. My mother did have a high school um, diploma. So to them, college was college. They didn't really know there was a difference between Penn mm -hmm. and Morgan State, which I chose. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad they didn't. And I think what uh, helped them to let me go is that I had an African-American uh, family physician and mm -hmm. he told my mother, please let her go to the, to the black college. Mm -hmm. The school is more than going to classes. If she goes to Penn, if she goes to Temple, she'll be fine in the classroom, but she will probably never have a date. She mm -hmm. will probably never um, participate in uh, extra or co-curricular activities because um, they just won't be open to her. Mm -hmm. Going to a black school will give her the full college experience. And he was right. Um, mm -hmm. So I had those that, you know, those, what I would call book ending experiences of my elementary school and my college, which was amazing to see these many people. I, I, I always smile when I see something on Baltimore uh, come across the news because often it's a person who I went to school with. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the Senate president pro tem is one of my classmates. I mean, it's like the Maryland Senate. And I'm like, wow, I cannot believe this. Um, the late Elijah Cummins, mm -hmm. Congressman Cum Cummins is on my board of trustees. Um, Kowasi Mfume is on that board of trustees. So I'm used to that level of what we now hear as black excellence. Mm -hmm. So it's frustrating for me to hear a different narrative about what the kids cannot do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for sharing that. Very powerful stories. Well, uh, let's dig in in this COVID context. Um, and so many people are talking about the COVID slide and um, exacerbated inequity and a time of um, importantly heightened focus on um, the experience of Black students in particular in our democracy and in our country. Um, what do you hope educators will hold on to as things that we know work as they prepare to um, support student learning in the coming year? So let me give you a little bit of a context because I've been giving a lot of talks about what I've called the hard reset or the need for the hard reset. Mm -hmm. um, use the analogy of um, these devices that we all mm -hmm. own. And we know when things go really, really bad and you can't find anything help on the internet, you finally make your way back to the Apple store or the Samsung store or LG or wherever you mm -hmm. got it. Mm -hmm. And they try a few things, but then they come with the dreaded word. <laughs> We're going to need to do a heart reset. Mm -hmm. If, they say that to you and you don't have everything backed up, what you're going to get back from them will be a working device 
that has none of the stuff you had in there before. Mm -hmm. Your pictures are gone, your contacts are gone. It's gonna be like it was from the factory. And I've been arguing that what needs to happen in our schools mm -hmm. is a hard reset. And that's, people don't wanna hear that. They wanna, people keep saying, we just need to get back to normal. Well, going back to normal for the kids that are most vulnerable is not a solution because normal was where the problem was. Wasn't working. Normal was not working. So I've been actually looking at and doing a lot of reading at, about nations that have had to start all over mm. uh, because of something catastrophic. Hmm. We've been talking about these pandemics. We've been talking about the two pandemics and I have been talking about it too, but I was recently in a, a talk, an NSF conference and the, one of my co-presenters said something that really struck me. He says, no, we're in the midst of four pandemics. Hmm. There is COVID-19. There is the civil and racial unrest or, or the, the racism. That's another mm -hmm. pandemic. Mm -hmm. But there's also um, an e the looming economic pandemic. Mm -hmm. It's going to be bad. You know, mm -hmm. we're propping things up with mm -hmm. stimulus packages and PPP and these kinds mm -hmm. of things to try to keep people uh, from falling through the cracks. But it's, we can't, that's not sustainable. Mm -hmm. so there's going to be a real economic pandemic. And then finally, um, there's climate catastrophes. Mm -hmm. You know, we look at these things from afar and think, mm -hmm. oh, that's over there. So yes, they had these terrible fires in Australia. I mean, like nothing we've ever seen before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And having visited Australia many times, I was like, oh my goodness, how are these, how are they making it? We've seen glimpses of it. Mm -hmm. Katrina was a glimpse of mm -hmm. it. And we've seen other, so all of these things are happening. So I've been interested looking at, well, how do nations, when they go through something catastrophic, how do they get back online? How do they come back? So I've looked at a major disruption in schooling, uh, which is World War II for places mm -hmm. like Japan and Italy. Mm -hmm. uh, Japan, of course, went through the devastation of uh, relentless fire bombing and then ultimately mm -hmm. dropping of the atomic bomb. Mm -hmm. um, they totally redid their school system mm -hmm. when they came back online. Totally. Mm -hmm. They didn't say, let's go, you know, everybody, let's, we're back. Let's turn to mm -hmm. page 27. It was like, you know what? We got to do this totally different. Mm -hmm. so one of their big innovations was that they decided to be more intentional about being co-educational. Mm -hmm. Before World War II, they didn't really care if girls got an education. Mm. So that was a huge change. Um, they also changed their organization of schools. So they actually mm -hmm. made their school organization more like um, the U.S. so that it was sort of a K-6, mm -hmm. three grades, and three grades. They, they copied it, mm -hmm. you know, from, oh, that, this is how they're doing it. We're, we're going to do it too. In Italy, similarly, they were concerned that we cannot raise another generation of fascists. This, mm -hmm. is, this is not good. Look what it got us. You know, mm -hmm. it, we've, we've suffered all this death, all this destruction. And so if you've heard of the Reggio Emilia mm -hmm. uh, preschools, which everybody just loves, they came out of that. It's like, what do we need to be have in place mm -hmm. to create the kind of uh, productive citizen, not a nationalist, Mm -hmm. Not someone who would think it's okay to go around the world and kill other people because mm -hmm. they're not good enough. So my concern is we keep using input models. What do we want to put into schools? What do mm -hmm. you know, we're going to have more math, we're going to have more reading, mm -hmm. we're going to have more uh, physical education, more art. I mean, each of these things is good in and of itself, but we're not asking the fundamental question. What are you trying to get out of this? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you want to see at the end? And not answering that question keeps us, in my mind, chasing our tails. We keep putting, doing the same things over and over and over again. I mean, the Germans said, we want people who can come and produce in this society. We don't want mm -hmm. a bunch of soldiers. The, the, the agreements don't allow us to, to, to build an army again. Mm -hmm. So we're going to make sure that people can be productive. So 
the entire Mercedes Benz, Volkswagen, mm -hmm. Bavarian Motor Works got together with schools and said, okay, well, here's what we can promise you mm -hmm. uh, in terms of working with students uh, so that everybody can have a living wage because they can come out of these schools and come into our programs. So what, what we are lacking is a vision. Mm -hmm. The only thing we know how to do is what we've been doing. Mm -hmm. I find that very compelling. I think um, technology also seems to be accelerating, if anything, during this pandemic. We, our reliance on it, the degree to which tech companies are getting all our money, and how we equip all of our children to be able to have access to the power that comes from technology, you know, is itself worth a full rethink of... Right. Um, what we're preparing kids for. Um, I find that very compelling. Um, so, so we need to do a hard reset. And I might press into, from your research, um, what would be some of the pillars that you think we should do the hard reset around? Like what, what, would, what becomes the anchor um, that you would propose in that vision? So one of the things that you're probably hearing a lot of conversation around, but maybe not much substance, is social emotional learning. Mm -hmm. uh, but what does that mean? And does, it, does social emotional learning for a youngster in the suburbs look like social emotional learning for a youngster in Manhattan? Does it look like mm -hmm. uh, social emotional learning for a youngster in um, rural Wisconsin? Mm -hmm. You know, what might be the most comforting thing for a kid in, in rural Wisconsin is to be able to be in, in a cow pasture, mm -hmm. you know, to sit out there with those cows. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whereas in Manhattan, it might be to have a headset on mm -hmm. and have the play set that I, the playlist I love the most, because that's the music that makes me feel happy. So we, we're using the term social emotional learning because we have in our mind one way to do this. You know, everybody on a yoga mat <laughs> with the thumb, thumb and first fingers together going, um, okay. That might be okay for some kids, but we cannot presume mm -hmm. that's what's going to be needed for all kids. Mm -hmm. And I would say in addition to social emotional learning, and I don't hear as much about this, is that there is a, a real need for good mental health mm -hmm. assessment just like we don't take kids in the school without um, looking at their vaccination Read. cards, mm, mm -hmm. we ought to be able to say, you know what, this kid is mentally mm -hmm. ready to engage in the kinds of activities that schools tend to work on. We have had kids who have not only missed the human contact of mm -hmm. being in school every day and seeing their friends and interacting with caring adults. We have also had kids who have been traumatized by mm -hmm. this, mm -hmm. whether it is someone who has been in a household where there has been some abuse, mm -hmm. whether it's someone who has been in a household where there has been, unfortunately, neglect because there hasn't been enough food mm -hmm. or people, people couldn't keep the lights on. Mm -hmm. um, and there are Kids who have seen people die. First of all, a lot of our kids saw somebody die just turning on the TV. They saw a man die mm -hmm. while they were sitting in their living room. Yeah. But there are other, many other kids who have, because of the unevenness of COVID-19, have known family members, friends, and neighbors who have died because they have been deemed essential workers. Mm -hmm. And so they're driving buses, they're working in grocery stores, they're working in the pharmacy, and they've been exposed and have died. And it's not as if kids don't know anything about death, but they have died without proper ritual. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we in, in the African-American community that, you know, one of the things that is really sacred is how, to, you know, what's, what's, we don't even call it a funeral, we call it a home going, mm -hmm. that you are called going home because your home is otherworldly. It's, it's not for the person who has died, they're, they're mm -hmm. gone, but it is for families and friends and loved ones 
to have that closure, to have people gather around you, to hug you. Mm -hmm. uh, I said to someone, I don't know whether I put it in a blog or not, but that I think I did put it in a blog, um, that George Floyd's family mm -hmm. gave us the home going we needed. We, mm -hmm. we needed to see, have the, the, the people stand up and speak well of him. We needed to have the singers. We needed the eulogy because we haven't had that. What we've heard is it can only be seven people at a funeral home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when you think about the heavy lift of both the social, emotional, and the mental health needs, mm -hmm. I'm not as worried about the academic. The academic will come. Mm -hmm. Kids will learn. We know kids are like sponges. They will learn. But if we don't attend to these really important emotional and mental uh, needs, mm -hmm. I don't think we have a fighting chance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. I, I heard in another conversation, you were talking about this grief hanging around kids' experience. And I think that that is so real. And just the trauma associated with the idea of testing even. Mm -hmm. um, I have a four-year-old, he got tested. It was very painful. I think if he was in school and someone said, we're taking a test today, he would think it meant a COVID test. Right. Um, and just the, the context of children's experience of the pandemic is their experience in school. Right. And, and one of the things I've noticed in my neighborhood, and I live in a, you know, relatively, from, from my viewpoint, I live in the suburbs. Of course, everybody <laughs> here says I live in the city because the, they have, what, a quarter of a million people. That, that's not a city. But anyway, <laughs> um, but I live in a nice neighborhood. And what struck me is that the teachers in the nearby elementary school, they've done these sort of drive-by caravans. Parades. Mm -hmm. Right? Nobody's come and dropped off a math packet. Mm -hmm. nobody's come and said, okay, we're going to go over some um, reading skills with you. No, people have driven by with balloon festoon cars and signs mm -hmm. all saying, we miss you. Mm -hmm. You know, we love you. Oh, we wish we could. And, and, and that's, what the ki that's what the kids have resonated to. Mm -hmm. Being able to see the people. Mm -hmm. um, to me, that, that, that's a cautionary tale. Mm -hmm. That if we just rush back into turning our children and youth into students mm -hmm. as opposed to whole people who have been through something mm -hmm. uh, you know a lot of times on the various tv programs you'll hear a statement like we're, we're we're all in this together well and i think i've said this a couple times we're all in the same storm mm -hmm. Mm. We are not all in the same boat. Mm -hmm. Some of some of y'all are riding this storm out in a luxury liner. You mm -hmm. got plenty of food. You got money in the bank. Mm -hmm. um, you you would rather be doing something else, but your in your inconvenience is just that inconvenient. Mm -hmm. Some people are trying to make it in a rowboat, mm -hmm. and they're taking on water, and. That for them, what's scary is the end of the month because when, how, when is it that the landlord no longer has to give them grace? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think those are the challenges mm -hmm. that lie ahead for us. I, I'd love to take that into um, some of the work educators need to think about and how they're engaging students in the coming year. Um, I think I've heard from a lot of principals and teachers that their biggest fear right now is um, how do I keep kids engaged? How do I keep my students engaged to use more precise wording? And I think a lot of that comes from feeling like some of the distance learning worked, but some of it really didn't. Um, and yet I, I watch our world right now and I see our youth very engaged in mm -hmm. the world. Mm -hmm. um, so your, your work in research, I think, is so relevant here. What, what do you think, like, are we even asking the right question when we say, how do I keep my students engaged? And how do we, as educators, think about that job in this particular time and context? So I guess I would say that the sentence is incomplete. 
because what's implied in that is how do I keep youth and student and uh, children engaged in what I want them to be engaged mm -hmm. in? Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that our young people have learned is there's other stuff to be engaged in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so if you're looking for engagement, you have to be willing to say, how do I merge the things that I am seeing as important with the things that kids see important for a kind of maximum engagement? If kids are worried about unequal treatment by the police, then we need to have that conversation mm -hmm. so that they can, for example, write the letter that goes to City Hall. Mm -hmm. My goal is to get them to be proficient writers. Mm -hmm. Their goal is to make a difference about what's happening in their neighborhoods. Uh, or they make some claim that, you know, the police always hassle us. Okay, that's an assertion. Where's the data? Okay, mm -hmm. now I'm in, I'm in the math now. Mm -hmm. I need you to survey the rest mm -hmm. of your classmates or I need you, you know, I need to divide folks up and say, you guys have the, the mm -hmm. sixth grade, you got the seventh graders, you've got the eighth grader. Let's compile the data. Let's do the graphs. Let's do the charts. All of the stuff that I really want to teach you, mm -hmm. I've got to teach you in a way that, you know, captivates your interest mm -hmm. and, and your, your desire to know certain things. Thank you for that. And, and let's take that to the school leader and system leader lens a little bit and um, think about the, I'd love to just hear more about your thoughts on curriculum and standards. Um, because I think for so many leaders, their drive, they, they have a thing they're, they're driving towards they feel is, is, you know, what they've been tasked with. And how right. do you create room to follow student interest in right. meaningful ways in that context? So I had a um, conversation with nine uh, school superintendents in the Bay Area at the, mm -hmm. in late spring. And one of the superintendents was clearly agitated of the fact that he knew he was gonna lose this money and he says, I'm a small school district and I'm already hearing I'm taking a $3.5 million hit. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, well, you're going to take a $3.5 million hit if what you plan to do is what you've been doing. Mm -hmm. I said, but if you're planning something different, you could plan it costing $3.5 million less mm -hmm. than what you had. Knowing that, what would you plan? And he, he just, he kind of looked at me. He said, I just never thought of it like that. Mm -hmm. So everybody's thinking, I just got to go back to what was there. I, yeah. So I've, you know, I've heard plenty of complaints about standards and standardized curriculum, things like Common Core. And I've often asked teachers, what's in this that you don't want students to know? It's, there, there's nothing evil mm -hmm. <laughs> about the standards. What is, quote, problematic, however, is sort of this dogged devotion to doing it one particular way, insisting that the only way that a student can learn uh, similes, metaphors, and mm -hmm. onomatopoeia is through a particular kind of literature, as opposed to being able to pick up some uh, hip hop lyrics and say, mm -hmm. well, what does he mean when he says, I'm, you know, I'm silent like a G mm -hmm. in lasagna, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> what is, you know, what is he saying there? Um, the, but we have to know more. Mm -hmm. And that more that we have to know is about students' lives, about their culture and about their experiences. It's in some ways the laziness on our part. We're used to using, you know, the scarlet letter, you know, or, mm -hmm. or whatever, which I can tell you universally, nobody likes. I, I, and I, don't, and I, and I don't care where they are. If they're in the suburbs, they're in the rural community, in the city, nobody likes a scarlet letter. As it should Amen. be. As it should be. Because do you believe the author sat down and said, oh, I'm going to write a book for ninth graders. Uh. All about a woman who is, is, is uh, accused of adultery. I mean, it makes no sense. Mm -hmm. So someone made a decision. That book belongs there. Maybe it doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, 
In fact, the, last week I had a conversation with a reporter out of New York who was looking at summer reading lists. Mm -hmm. And she sent me reading lists from 15 different high schools in New York. Uh, think about this. Freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors. Mm -hmm. Some of which had them um, tiered. So I got the regular, I got the AP mm -hmm. gifted, and I got the ISS or the students who need instructional support. So it might have been three different for four. Wow. So I mean, just book after book list after book list after book list. And, you know, she wanted some statement from me about what I thought. And I said, there's nothing wrong with the books. Mm -hmm. The books tell me nothing. I need to know what you intend to do with the books. Mm -hmm. You know, so yeah, if you want to, you can count how many books are written by black people, how many books are written by um, mm -hmm. La Latinx folks, how many books are written by Asian descent people, mm -hmm. how many, you can do that, mm -hmm. but you can do bad things with a book written by black people. Mm -hmm. You could do some great things with a book written by a white person. If you're not paying attention to kids' interests, some mm -hmm. kids are really into this dystopian stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't really like that. I, <laughs> it's the real world scary enough for me. Mm -hmm. I already feel like I'm in the Hunger Games. Mm -hmm. But that's something that, you know, that kids might like. It, mm -hmm. the, the, the text can't be, the text can't teach itself. Mm -hmm. So I, in some ways I'm agnostic about standards until you start telling me, you know, people cannot go on to the next grade if they don't meet standard mm -hmm. X. People are not considered, uh, it's not a good school if you don't have this percentage of kids proficient mm -hmm. on the standard. No, that, that standard is just telling me what you're not teaching well. It's not mm -hmm. telling me what kids don't know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. Um, one last question. What do you see educators do, maybe from a place of very good intentions, that we actually know does not work, particularly in supporting unfinished learning and um, meaning things that we're really at risk of doing uh, in the coming year as that is more front and center for so many educators? So I, it, your question makes me think of two things. One is that our, we're quick to go to remediation. Mm -hmm. Now, just think about that in principle. I begin behind everybody else. And the way you expect me to catch up is to slow me down. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just basic physics. That doesn't work. <laughs> right? If anything, I should be accelerated. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's the work, uh, you know, Hank, Hank Levin did that work in the late 70s, early 80s. Mm -hmm. accelerated learning, demonstrating that kids who were behind needed to be moved up faster. Faster. Mm -hmm. um, I think the other thing that I, I have concerns about is that because students are not just students, but they're whole human beings. So they come into classrooms, schools and classrooms with a variety of life experiences we make some judgments about those life experiences and mm -hmm. as a consequence we don't hold kids to these so-called standards mm -hmm. so we do what i call um give them permission to fail oh don't worry about that you know mm -hmm. maybe tomorrow you'll feel more like working oh i understand things are tough for you uh, whereas we would never do that with the kids for whom we have the highest expectations. For mm -hmm. them, we do what I call, we demand mm -hmm. success. Mm -hmm. We demand it. You must do it. Mm -hmm. um, now, doesn't mean we're harsh with it. What we may do with that is they turn in something we don't think it's quality, and we say to them, I'm going to give you another chance to work on this mm -hmm. because here's what's wrong with it as opposed to for those kids for whom we um, per permit to fail, they turn in something, it's low quality. And we say, well, you know, this is probably the best you can do. Mm -hmm. And we will accept that. So I hope we don't fall back into that. Mm 
Mm-hmm. It, can we dig into that? Just to, I know I said last question, but um, you've done so much research around this conversation about expectations and um, for, for whom we have high expectation, what teachers have high expectations for different groups of students. What from that learning do you hope educators keep in mind this year about what we know about how to influence our own expectations of students or for leaders about how to set a culture that supports that for, for their faculty? Yeah, I mean, I think it, the, the challenging part is that a lot of this has to do with people's belief systems. Mm-hmm. And you don't change belief systems just by telling people have high expectations. Mm-hmm. Um, teachers are people too. Mm-hmm. We've been influenced by our own backgrounds and experiences. And if we've never seen excellence among certain groups of kids, it's really hard to tell us, oh, you got to believe this kid can be excellent. Mm -hmm. So there's a fair amount of unlearning Mm -hmm. that teachers have to do about who is capable. Mm -hmm. Um, And we have to have better, what I guess for one of another term, formative assessments to be able to Mm -hmm. watch students along the way Mm -hmm. as opposed to slamming them at the end of a semester or at the March testing period. Be Mm -hmm. able to look along the way. Um, One of the things that I've kind of railed against, and I don't think many teachers like me for saying this, but I just think homework for the most part is a waste of time. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you give credit for something that you've had no ability to supervise? Mm -hmm. And we've all seen the juxtaposition between somebody who does this fabulous homework Mm -hmm. but they struggle on an assessment in the class it's because somebody else doing the homework (laughs) you know we've all seen it we've all gone Mm -hmm. to the science fair and the nine-year-old comes in with nuclear fission right Mm -hmm. and we're sitting there pretending like oh yeah he did that (laughs) never mind that his father is a a nuclear physicist Mm -hmm. okay he didn't do it and most of our international peers don't really do homework. What they mm-hmm. tell kids to do is read and study. Mm-hmm. You know, read and study because it's going to be in class where I can assess what you know. We, as a, as a nation, give too much credit for what kids have as opposed mm-hmm. to what they know. Mm-hmm. So you have two college-educated parents. You have access to high-speed internet. You Mm -hmm. have disposable income in your household that can buy you, you know, science kits and memberships to the Mm -hmm. Museum of Natural Science. You have that. But Mm -hmm. I don't know what you know. Mm -hmm. And I think to the degree that we get better at figuring out what kids know, then we can Mm -hmm. give them honest assessments of um, their their abilities. Mm Thank you so much for this conversation. I could keep asking questions all day. We could talk No, you couldn't because I got to go meet with the people at the Children's Museum. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Ladson Billings, for joining Rethinking Intervention, and we look forward to continuing to learn from your work and inspiration. Sure. Have a good day.